to our presentation. I'm Justin. Our team members are Christy, Aisha, Carolina, Amber, and Matt. The organisation we interviewed a social worker from is the Alfred Hospital Trauma Unit. Justin and I are going to discuss the history of the organisation and the services it provides. So Justin, what did you find out about the organisation? Thanks Matt. The Alfred Hospital is a publicly funded hospital which is Melbourne's second oldest hospital and was founded in 1871 after resistance from the Melbourne Hospital establishment. It provides specialty services in the treatment of cancer, asthma, allergies and psychiatry, as well as services in cardiology and neurosurgery. It is also heavily involved with medical education, having training links with La Trobe and Monash universities, and research protocols with Baker IDI, the Burnett Institute and Monash University as partners through its Alfred Medical Research and Education precinct. More specifically, although the Alfred has been performing trauma care in different ways for over 100 years, a dedicated Alfred trauma service has been operating since 1984 and is one of three Victorian major trauma services, along with those provided by the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Royal Children's Hospital. It has become the largest and most active trauma service in Australasia, with over 5,000 trauma cases admitted annually. The unit itself has a 44-bed ward and the hospital has a dedicated on-site helipad. The organisation has changed since conception in numerous ways. Though still on the original site, the Alfred has grown significantly in physical size and encompasses other suburban hospitals within its management. It has from early years encompassed training as part of its service growth. It has been a leader in progressive health implementation and social work has been a significant part of supporting patients and their families through the treatment period and beyond. Technology change, pressures on service demand and structural changes such as managerialistic service practices have meant accountability is framed through deliverable outcomes and key performance indicators. These changes, as with similar neoliberal practices, can be viewed as impersonal and business-like but are balanced with the Alfred's commitment to programs of accessibility and patient-centred care. So Matt, have you got some information on the Alfred services for us? I do Justin, thank you. So reiterating what Justin has just told us, the Alfred Hospital is one of the biggest hospitals in Melbourne. The hospital has a range of specialised services and departments, and these can range from medical and diagnosis wards right through to burns units and neurosurgery departments. We met with a social worker from the trauma service. Our social worker was a grade one social worker and we'll explain a little bit more about that later. As Justin just told us, in 1984 the trauma service was established at the Alfred and till this day has been an enormous success, being the largest and most active trauma service in Australia. The Alfred trauma service is one of three Victorian major trauma services and treats over half of all major Victorian trauma cases. The service provides integrated emergency, trauma and critical care, 25 hours a day, 365 days a year. Within the trauma service lies the patient and family services department. This is where our interview social worker is situated. A major focus for social work in the trauma service is to identify and address the psychosocial impacts for both patients and families that illness and hospitalisation brings about. Social work does this through providing a range of different services, all designed to increase quality of life and enable patient and family participation in care. A key role for our social worker was the assistance in helping patients and their families make a smooth transition from the hospital to home. Social workers also perform services such as counselling, discharge planning, crisis interventions, bereavement counselling, family support, care coordination, making appropriate referrals. So now we're going to hear from Christy and Amber. Thanks. Hi, I'm Amber and I'm going to be talking about the mission and value statements of the Alfred Hospital organisation. So the values of the organisation include integrity. The Alfred engage others in a respectful, ethical and fair manner, fulfilling their commitments as professional and employees. They ensure the highest degree of dignity, equity, honesty and trust. Accountability. 
They show pride, enthusiasm and dedication in everything that they do. They ensure quality patient care and use resources appropriately. They accept professional responsibility for all their decisions and actions. Collaboration. They consult and collaborate with others and respect the diverse knowledge and skills of their partners. Working as a team and ensuring that the best interprofessional patient care. Knowledge. They create opportunities for education and are committed to continuous development. They enable everyone to make knowledge-based decisions. The mission of the Alfred. That includes the highest quality clinical practice. Delivering in partnership with patients, carers, the community and other health care providers, enabled through innovation, research and education. The vision of the Alfred Hospital. Trusted to deliver outstanding care. Hi, I'm Christy and I'll be talking about the organisational culture for the Alfred Hospital. So organisational culture can be defined as a pattern of basic assumptions invented, discovered or developed by a given group as it learns to cope with its problems from external adaption and internal integration that has worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore to be taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think and feel in relation to these problems. There are two forms of culture that are present in organisations, the formal and informal culture. By formal culture, I refer to how people are expected to behave according to the missions and value statements endorsed by the organisation. This includes policies and practices that protect workers, le protect workers legally. As previously mentioned by Amber, employees are expected to show professionalism by conducting themselves in accordance to these expectations. Employees of the Alfred Hospital are meant to provide high quality care by being creative, using research and being well educated. Staff should behave in a respectable and ethical manner. They should treat their clients with dignity, honesty and trust. Employees of the Alfred Hospital should, provide, should show pride and enthusiasm in their work and must be held accountable for their decisions and actions. In order to gain diverse knowledge, staff should consult and collaborate with other allied health professionals in order to provide the best care. The philosophy adapted by the Alfred is to provide patient-centered care. Employers should make knowledge-based decisions, which means keeping up with new developments and continuing to educate themselves. The strategic plan developed in 2012 to 2015 by the Alfred Hospital states that patients come first. It is up to staff and uh, it's up to the staff of the hospital to provide excellence in healthcare. Education and research should be developed to provide optimal care. The informal culture is all about how people actually work in the organisation. It looks at the relationships between people you work with and how you build rapport. This information was given by a social worker we interviewed, seeing as it's like the behind the scenes of the organisation. Our social worker emphasised the importance of developing good relationships with other allied health professionals. It is one of the four R's that is important in the informal culture of the organisation. By keeping good records and by being thorough in your assessments, other health workers begin to trust your work and value your professional opinion. You also need to be confident in what your analysis is by having valid arguments and evidence for your claims. Um, other allied health professionals will appreciate your work and this is how good rapport is built. In future, when social workers may need to request, request for referrals, other health workers will be able to trust your evaluation and are more likely to agree with your assessment and help provide the services user with a referral. We will now be moving on to Aisha and Carolina. Hello, my name is Aisha and this here with me is Carolina. So Carolina, today you'll be talking about organisation structure and finance, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct, Aisha. To begin with, the Alfred Hospital has clear roles and responsibilities set in the organisation structure that are assigned to specific treating units, trauma, burns, orthopaedic, um, those are a few of the treatment An electronic and verbal referral is made to a program within each department. There is a grade one, grade two, and grade three, and so on. And within the medical terms, you have interns, residents, registers and consultants, as well as professors. At the Alfred Hospital, everyone answers to a supervisor who they report to for assistance. Within each department, there are various teams 
that have their own way of working that may be different approach compared to another department. The Alfred manager reports to various executives within the hospital that are under the Alfred Health executive team and under Alfred Health board. So that was the organisational chart. At the very top is Andrew Way, which has been a health ally, chief executive, senior officer, and the main director for more than five years. He concentrates on improving access, ensuring high quality, safe services with low mortality and engaging with patients' experiences with all strong financial framework. Reporting under him, there are seven senior officers and directors that report to, to the executive chief. Speak uh, about also the chart a little bit more on that. There's programs within the chart. As you can see, um, there is uh, names, and under their names, they uh, run certain programs, uh, projects as well, and services with one of them being a major one, which is the trauma service where we um, interviewed our social worker. Um, the Alfred receives funding from federal and state governments due to it being a public hospital. Most patients are treated with um, public um, patient care, which means there's no fee and it's covered by Medicare. Patients are expected to pay if they are not an Australian citizen. Um, they are not, um, they would have to pay. Um, and if they're not a resident as well, or if they are a traveller, they will have to pay as well if they don't have any travel insurance. In regards to finance of the Alfred, there is various targets and expectations for all services to um, meet the requirements. Uh, so basically the suspected direct links, which um, is how you can receive funding. So the annual federal budget has significant influence on how the Alfred Hospital funds its programs, projects and services. Um, so that's about it for finance. So I'd like to just uh, stop right there and um, I'll hand over to for Aisha. So, well, thank you for that, Marilyn. That was very you. informative. Thank you. So, Aisha, I believe that you were going to talk to us about organisational governance. Yes, I am. So, I'm going to talk about organisational governance. So, um, I just like I would like to begin by um, defining the governance. So, organisational governance encompasses the rules, policies, systems, and processes by the organisation. Um, and how it's controlled and directed. So the Alfred commits to continual improvement in order to provide the best possible care for the, their patients. So they aim to improve safety and to enhance practice and to improve access and to integrate services. One, one of the ways is that this has been implemented is through the Clinical Governance Unit. So they support these goals by facilitating the development of quality and patient safety systems at the Alfred. So in a hospital setting in which clinical government, governance sorry, is the framework through which organisations are accountable for their continuous improvement of the quality of their services and safeguard high standards of care by creating an environment in which, excel, which sorry, excels in clinical care which will flourish. So the four guiding principles of effective clinical governance are to one, um, build a culture um, of trust and honesty through open disclosure of partnership with the clients. The second is foster organisational commitment to a continuous improvement of the hospital. And third is to establish a rigorous system to identify, monitor and respond to any, any incidents. Sorry. And lastly, to evaluate and respond to key aspects of organisational performance. So I just want to touch very briefly on components of the framework. So there are three main components of clinical gov governance. So the first being um, elements of governance, components, and clinical governance. The second, um, dominance areas for action and deliver safe and effective care. 
And lastly, focus on patients at the centre, so going where the patients are at. Mm -hmm. So moving on, I wanted to talk about um, the constitution of an organisation. So generally speaking, the constitution of an organisation should contain key agreements made by the members on how organisations will work. In basic terms, a constitution is simply a set of written rules or a multilateral agreement governing the aims of the organisation on how it will run and how the members will work together. Some think, um, some think of governance as mechanisms of accountability, so this is to ensure that staff and other members of the organisation deliver on what they have promised. So an organisational constitution is quite significant. So the significance of this is because that it will act as a point of reference yeah. and will help resolve any problems or controversies that may arise. Yes. And it will also reassure the public and funding bodies that your group is properly running and that the money is being effectively managed. Mm -hmm. So in relation to this, the Alfred, to ensure that all research confirms to good practice and ethical expectations, Alfred Health has in place a set of policies, guidelines and procedures that are in accordance with the Australian Code for Responsibility, Conduct of Research. So this is in 2007. Mm -hmm. And the Alfred's Health Policy on Responsibility, Conduct of Research. So in conjunction with this, there are many different Acts of Parliament which are relevant and there are many different branches of the hospital. However, there are three main, consist uh, there are three main acts mm -hmm. which are consistent throughout the hospital and are used by all medical professionals. Mm -hmm. So the first one being the 1973 Public Records Act. So um, any information that is stored um, will later be disposed of in, any, um, in accordance sorry, with the Act. Alfred, he um, sorry, Alfred Health has technology and security measures aimed to protect personal and health information, whether that is paper-based or electronic form. So this is to ensure that there is no misuse, um, loss of um, the papers, paperwork, mm -hmm. and to make sure that there is unauthorised access or authorised disclosure. Sure. So secondly, the 1982 Freedom of Information Act. So this is um, where individuals have the right to request access to their personal information held by the Alfred. There is a process to this, but if you do it through this act, it's very easy to get information. And lastly, um, I would like to just talk about the last act. Yes. Um, and so this is in accordance with the Victorian government policy and legislation. Mm -hmm. So Alfred, Alfred Health protects the privacy of professional and health information. It, hold, it holds and uses it only for the purpose of intended, mm -hmm. so to determine patients mm -hmm. and what they need. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I would like to mention before we wrap up today is um, the Alfred Health Board. And so the Alfred Health Board was established in July of 2000 and it has nine members. These nine members are usually elected by a panel of senior doctors. Mm -hmm. And also this could also contain a CEO or executive doctor. Mm -hmm. So I'll wrap up for now. But that concludes governance and structure within the Alfred. Oh, thank you so much, Aisha. That was very interesting. And thank I think you. now we will be moving on to the group discussion about um, interviewing our social worker and what we've got in the ideas. Thank you very much. Enjoy. We're having our discussion now on the Alfred Hospital trauma unit and the social worker interview. Um, so who would like to start us with some questions and discussion? I would love to start. Um, one of the journal questions was reflect on what you would think it would be like to be a client or service user of this organisation. And would the voice of the client or service user be heard? Why and why not? Um, I think as a service user, I would have a positive experience if I was at the Alfred. Um, the Alfred Hospital's philosophy is around patient-centred care. And with this belief, the client will be heard and their concerns listened to because the focus is around the client. Would someone like to talk about uh, the concept of managerialism? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so our social worker at the Alfred said that Managerialism relates to issues like bed flow. For example, um, it can cost between six hundred and one thousand dollars a day to keep a patient in a bed in the trauma unit. 
And so then it is your responsibility as the um, social worker to justify keeping that patient in the hospital. So if a doctor suggests that a patient is ready for discharge, it is then you, the social worker's role, to advocate on behalf of that patient. Good point. Thank you. Good point. I think yeah, a lot. it's a good point because advocacy is a big part of the social worker's job. Yes. yes. So I think that's a very good point. That's right. But managerialism makes it difficult for the social worker because uh, everything has to be justified and um, because it's run as a business and every cent has to be counted, um, then advocacy comes up against that wall of um, trying to. Um, you know, get the best care for the, the client. Cost versus care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, as well, like, which, patient, which patients are going to be turned away? Like, mm -hmm. where's the priority in who gets to be served, who doesn't get to be served, who gets the bed, who doesn't get the bed? Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, I found it interesting that she mentioned also about the shift in priorities in her work, which were like social worker role to always have the needs of the client and at the same time be flexible to have things thrown at her out of nowhere in regards to different roles, depending on how many staff there is. Um, she mentioned there were seven trauma staff members there, so if someone's sick, it's not always um, just the load that she normally gets and you never know um, in a day how many clients you would get as well so um, and three of them were full-time she also said so that was really interesting to um, always be flexible and have um, different jobs redistributed to depending how many people are there for the day so um, I think um, yeah that's really good that they can you know take that on and be flexible alongside with things yeah I do like when the social worker interviewed said about redistributing the workload like if um, it was just getting too hectic and there was more patients on the ward then she could deal with that you take it back to the group and redistribute so um, you won't be so burned out in all the work so yeah yeah and that was good because um you have a team that you're going to rely on and um if anything's going on, you can have one another at each other's back and everything, so that was really good. Yeah. I think it's um, also building on what you said, um, it's really good that if you can't deal with a certain client, that you have people mm -hmm. above you that can help you and kind of walk you through the process of assisting that patient. So I thought that was really good to have. Yeah, from what she said, it sounded like they've got a good framework within the organisation, so if something isn't quite working like that, then the group can um, assist or there's um, supervision and that sort of thing. Yeah, and lots of help and supervision. Mm, that was a big point, the supervision. If you were struggling or needed to clarify or talk about what you've, the decision you've made for your client, that you have another body to talk to, um, that was pretty good. So another interesting question that we asked the social worker was how does she build trusting relationships between herself and the client? She responded with several ideas and um, techniques that she puts in place when working with a client. These um, involve things like developing trust and rapport, um, honesty, with the client explaining why she's there and and what she intends to get out of having this client, what she wants them to get out of having her as a social worker. Um, Going to where the client's at. Yes, yeah, and making making sure that the client's not always giving too much information if they don't need to. Yeah, so setting or, boundaries and avoiding re-traumatizing specific clients. Um, also explaining the role of the social worker, she said, that's yeah, very important yeah. so they're not unaware of what's going on. And it really helps with that idea of context so that they know what they're, what they're even in that meeting for. Yeah, and also explaining that her role is short term. So the person that she's um, talking to may need to repeat their story to a different social worker or different service. So it's just warning them that that could be 
a very real possibility of removing that trauma again. Mm -hmm. okay. It's important that the client knows that because um, it can be quite confronting to relive those situations. Yeah, she also talked about assessment and service and discharge, so talking to them through that and how long it may take so they're not unaware of it might be a short-term thing or a little bit longer than expected. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they may need to repeat their story for long-term services. Um, this is why she needs to talk to them in regards to assessment. Mm -hmm. um, does someone want to discuss metaphors that the Alfred might be using? Sure, I'd love to. So the alphabet presents a um, downstream structure. They adopt a machine metaphor in the sense that the hospital um, emphasizes work in a multidisciplinary team. So they work with dis uh, other team members in like the hospital. So you have your allied health members. Um, so a team of allied health professionals work together to um, achieve a goal. So these goals could be working with um, a specific patient that's come into the hospital, presenting with different issues. And um, they'll work together on this team to be able to come up with an effective solution, which is either short term or long term, and then they'll be able to achieve this solution. Cool. Thank you.